are men who are able to write really good characters, and generally, in my experience, when I've talked to them about it, it turns out that they have sisters. Yes. Uh, or, you know, they have, they grew up they in a family up. with, you know, a very uh, conversational mother and sisters yeah. and all, and they're perfectly comfortable in kind of a female world. Yeah. Well, um, I, I actually read your second book first. It just happened to come to me <laughs> from your then publisher in, the, in America, Crown. Um, shadows and bronze and then I had to go out and hunt up silver pigs when I was coming over to talk to you and I think they read very much as one one novel yes and that's me being um, an inexperienced author I think wasn't there like a five minute gap between the end of the action and silver pigs and the start of the there's next a, one no Maybe there's, it's, 20 it's longer hours? than that because the body has to decay I, I am a neat sort of person and it struck me that there are a lot of books where the murderer is killed because that's very convenient and you don't have to mess about having a trial and that's the end you, you hear of, of it and um, it seemed to me as a woman and I am being a woman here that some poor person would have to go along and clear away the body so Falco gets that job but he gets it 11 days afterwards and it's in Rome and it's very hot so that gave me a quite a interesting starting point for Shadows in Brown. Yes, it was a very arresting opening. Um, and with of course, maggots, as I recall. It was, something very, you know, sort of CSI, but with an Yes, but there. we didn't have CSI then. What I, what I had done was to read a pathologist's memoirs as part of my ah. research, and that was full of maggots and what happens to bodies when they're really quite old. So I, I enjoyed that. See, so you were a woman so, ahead of your time there, introducing the forensic note to the yes, historical, which indeed. has happened, I might say, quite a lot since. But anyway, what was so interesting when I was reading Shadows and Bronze was that there were references back to things, although not tiresomely so, in Silver Pigs. And so I was, you know, could hardly wait to finish Satter's Shadows and Bronze and rush out to get Silver Pigs to see what, in fact, I'd missed doing all that. Um, and, and I found that was kind of a fun way to come to it. But what also happened is then Falco goes to Britain in Silver Pigs. I felt I had to bring him to Britain because don't forget when I wrote that I still had no publisher and I was to find, trying to find ways to make the Romans accessible and one way to do it was to have him in Britain which is ours and hopefully would um, attract them and it worked. <laughs> where in Britain was he in Silver Pigs? He is mostly in a silver mine where he has horrible experiences while disguised as a slave. And in fact, silver pigs are... Are oh, ingots. In fact. Right. So it's, so it's... It's the ingots are the key of the plot. And this, this is one of the um, things I have to address. They are real ingots, or some of them are real ingots, which were found. They're an archaeological relic. Um, but then you have the problem, which is why I don't do it very often, that if Falco encounters them and finds them, they won't be in the place where later archaeologists will dig them up. You can't, for example, have Falco find a body under a floorboard and later on archaeologists find it because he will have dug it up and it won't be there. So he has to put them back. He, has to, he can't carry them. He's too, too wounded at the time and he has to hide them under a cairn, which is where they really were found. And then because it's Britain, he's, he's not likely ever to go back and pick them up. But he did go back. In fact, he some years back, later, yes. you did return the body in the bathhouse. Um, and, uh, you went back to, to England and you had a kind of construction trade. I think that might have had a little echo in your own life oh, it there, did. wasn't it? Yes. You were doing yes. construction. I, w I worked for the government department that looked after and built where necessary government buildings of all kinds. And so the body in the bathhouse is set in Fishbourne Roman Palace which had been discovered in my lifetime, really. And I remember when I was at school that the archaeologist, uh, Barry Cunliffe, who, who dug it up, came and talked to us about it before he was even sure that it was the amazing Roman palace that it, it turned out to be. I can actually remember him saying that he was hoping it would be something really big, and we all sat there thinking, no, he's deluding himself. We have nothing like that in England. In fact, we only have that one, so we were right in a way. Um, Falco goes there, and it is fortuitously um, at the year in Roman times that he, he goes there. They had an enormous makeover, remodeling, as you would call it, uh, done 
probably because Vespasian was giving it as a treat to the king who had supported him, who, who lived in the palace. And curiously, at the same time on television in England, I don't know if it was the same here, we had lots and lots of programs on how to remodel your home. So it all fitted most wonderfully. It does. It's an absolutely fascinating book, and I have myself made a pilgrimage to visit Fishbourne it Palace. It is one of the most of amazing sites, books. isn't it? And it is. It's beautiful how they run it, and, and their educational facilities are some of the best I've ever seen at a site. Actually, it's no stretch at all to have taken Falco to England. I mean, not only was no. England, in fact, part of the Roman Empire, but there's some really excellent Roman things. I mean, yeah. I've been to visit York. I've been to Hadrian's Wall. I've been which to wasn't there in his time. Not in I, no. don't, I don't have to have him up there sending home for underpants because it's so cold, like the poor soldiers who are up there. What I did do was I kept him there for a, another book after the Fishbourne one, so that I could do Roman London, which is where I live and where they had found lots of new stuff just fairly recently. They and that found was the, the Jupiter theater. myth. Yes. And you carried on that idea of a native king, um, you know, and the Romans and how they interacted as part of the plot, if I yes, remember right. Yes, but I, that was one of the things that interested me, was, was how the Romans did colonize um, a new province and how they managed to do it successfully, which, of course, um, has strange resonances with what your country and my country are doing in foreign countries now. And again comes up in Saturnalia in the same way. The Romans managed somehow to allow native people to keep their own religion, to keep what they wanted of their own way of life, so long as they accepted a certain amount of Romanization and agreed that the emperor was the emperor, which of course went wrong in Palestine. Um, and they did it successfully. It was barbarians who destroyed them, not, not revolt, although there was a revolt in Britain because we are like that. <laughs> <laughs> I've always thought that the Romans were incredibly pragmatic and, yes. and not really ideologues. No. And I think as a result, uh, they didn't have um, a belief system that they had to impose and threaten people. They just sort of got on with it. They put in roads and they did plumbing and they you know, did administration and all the practical things. Plus, they really were very good at, at the cohorts and the, um, and the military stuff. But um, they made things work. And I'm sure life was, in fact, more comfortable. Yes, and that was how they succeeded, because it's exactly what we are not doing in a place like Iraq. We are not going and building schools and building roads. We've destroyed it. Whereas the Romans would come and they would say, you'll like this. <laughs> Here's a bathhouse. Isn't it nice? And people would generally fall for it. Well, I think they're remarkable people. But what you did set up then in this first two books, the, the pair, which I think of as the first novel, uh, was the pattern for Falco to, in fact, go out of Rome, which you've carried on in many other yes, books. Yes, and that's part of me wanting um, a certain amount of variety. That A lot of books we have, um, Falco in one book will be pounding the streets of Rome as a classic, classical city detective in his own city and I like writing about that I, I am a city girl myself but then um, the next book he will go to a part of the Roman Empire partly because it's such wonderful material and so good for me to go on a little holiday to some some part of generally Europe but not always that I've not been to um, and he has a different kind of adventure when he's abroad quite often he does well let's see he's been to Spain in a dying mm -hmm. light in Cordoba Yes. And he did a theatrical tour of several cities. In Syria. Uh, were they all in Syria? They were all in Roman Syria, whether okay. they're now, Which some of them bigger would be Jordan. Than. Yes. And that book was? That was Last Act in Palmyra. Okay. And where else has he gone? He's been to Libya, um, and I have too which I would never have done as a civil servant. Was that That's, two for the lion? Um, or three? Two for the lions. Two for the lions, right. <laughs> yes. Um, he's been to Greece in C. Delphi and I very recently for not the Olympic Games because he accidentally goes in the wrong year. That was partly my fault. <laughs> and um, he may be going to Egypt in the one that I'm slowly starting to evolve now.